Good afternoon. Welcome to another A Push video with Mr. Pate for Barlow High School. Today we're looking at 9 11 and the second Bush presidency. Right here behind me, of course, you have the iconic image of 9 11 of the World Trade Center getting hit by the airplane. And it really came to define, obviously, in our minds as Americans, uh, a new century had begun, a new millennium had begun. And yet, how long will the impact of this last? Truly, this has been something that dramatically shifted. Uh, U.S. feelings, U.S. policy, um, it's really just changed a lot of things worldwide and within America. And so let's go ahead and find out how this all occurred. In 1979, it's a pretty momentous year, you have the Iran hostage crisis going on, which creates a serious level of antagonism between the United States and Iran. You also have the dawning in late 1979 1980 of the Iran-Iraq war. Uh, they go to war. This war is going to last for 10 years. We've got a map over here. Here's Iraq. Here's Iran. Iraq was, uh, has a Shia population of uh, Muslims, but it also was controlled by Saddam Hussein and a Sunni minority. Iran was a Shia majority uh, country as well. They're going to battle, and this is going to be a rare conventional war. Conventional wars weren't really happening that much. You had a lot of guerrilla war. You had nuclear brinksmanship. But this is a conventional war that does go on and lasts for about a decade. So that's one thing that's going on. Another thing that's going on that starts in 1979, it's kind of off my map, so I have to apologize. Right over here, you've got Afghanistan. And Afghanistan, of course, is going to be invaded by the Soviet Union, who's looking for a warm water port and expansion. And this is going to lead to, as Mujahideen, um, guerrilla resistance that forms and this guerrilla resistance is going to partially be supported by the CIA and the United States government in general. Why you might ask? For the same reason that the Soviet Union supported the North Vietnamese and the North Koreans. It's this kind of proxy war fight going on. So now the Soviet Union is going to be engaged in what will eventually become their Vietnam and when this happens um, essentially they are going to get drugged down into this fight. Now, a misconception that's out there is that the United States actually funded bin Laden. And bin Laden put it out there that he was this great military leader of the people. Bin Laden was one of 57 kids. He was someone that was, uh, his family was a construction magnate. They just were this gigantic construction family of billionaires. And bin Laden is going to be somebody that he is going to kind of be a logistical boss, a politician, so to speak. He's going to be the guy that's on video. He's going to be the guy that helps get them logistical, get them supplies. And he's going to help run things and be kind of the front man. I know there are a few pictures on the internet you can find of him that they'd feature in these videos of him with the AK-47. I've not seen any historical evidence. Um, things that I've looked up, I research does not bear out that he was like leading the charge in these Mujahideen attacks. It also, history does not bear out that he was directly uh, supplied with money and arms, but clearly U.S. arms did go to Afghanistan and the Mujahideen and later some of those are going to be used against the United States. So 1979, you have the Iran-Iraq start of a 10-year conventional war that's going to be draining both sides and Soviet invasion of Afghanistan that's going to lead to radical Muslims uh, wanting to eject them and, and leading a long-term concerted guerrilla fight to uh, basically kick the Soviets out of their country. All right, that's 1979, Operation Desert Storm. So one of the things that's going to happen uh, related to the Iran-Iraq War is you're essentially going to see Saddam Hussein become impoverished as a result of the 10-year uh, Iran-Iraq War. He needs money, he, he, and one, his solution to this essentially is going to be a smaller neighbor, Kuwait, which is an oil-rich country, very peaceful, didn't have a large military. He decides to launch an invasion, take over Kuwait, basically colonize it, jack all of their resources, money, and especially their oil, and just kind of strip them down, kind of like the Soviets did to East uh, Germany, and basically just re-enrich himself and Iraq by taking them over. Okay, this is, that's his reasoning. That's why he does this. This is not going to be viewed in a positive light by the United States, nor Europe, nor the world in general. For one, this is just naked aggression. Secondly, 
there is a concern that if he takes over Kuwait, he will become bigger and stronger, get more weapon systems, and he will eventually, maybe, would he take over other oil producing countries such as the UAE or Qatar or Saudi Arabia even, and then he could really have major control of the world's oil supply and really become a gigantic major world dictator on the global stage. So uh, President Bush, the first Bush, George H.W. Bush, he's going to get kind of a UN ap approval, which they give. He is going to give, uh, get a coalition of 28 countries that are all going to send in troops. And basically they're going to use Saudi Arabia as a staging area. And then you know, eventually they launch an invasion. And in less than 100 hours, they wipe out Saddam's invasion army. Uh, there's this, you know, series of photographs about the highway of death where as they lose control in Kuwait and they're quickly ejected back, fighter bombers are like attacking these Iraqi troops on this highway back into Iraq and just lay waste to this just massive, I mean, it's just literally, it looks like a traffic jam except every vehicle's been destroyed. Well, George H.W. Bush is going to make a decision not to invade Iraq. He's going to decide... We're only going to stick with Kuwait. Uh, we're going to liberate Kuwait, and then we're going to enforce some sanctions on Iraq and try and weaken it. So they put a no-fly zone over most of Iraq. They have these strong economic sanctions. Iraq's not allowed to sell its oil to anybody. And generally, people are around the world, the world community, is pretty supportive of this because of what Saddam's done and the threat he posed if he took over, say, a major percentage of the world's oil supply. So that's Operation Desert Storm and the invasion of Kuwait and the U.S. response. But one of the things that's going to occur after this is, fatefully, the United States is going to decide, the, the Saudi Arabians are worried, what if Saddam decides later on to surprise attack us and come and lay waste to us and kill our people and take control of our country? He doesn't, they don't want that. So they say, will you please leave some troops permanently stationed here as well as Kuwait as a deterrent? Because if there's U.S. troops near the Iraqi border of Saudi Arabia, there's no way... Saddam Hussein's going to attack straight at the United States. That would just invite an invasion of him. So they have all these restrictions on Iraq. Saudi Arabia has uh, U.S. troops on their soil staying there. And this is going to irritate one Osama bin Laden. Al-Qaeda, which means the base, is going to uh, not only form, bin Laden is going to start by going to the Saudi government and saying, you know, he can get an audience with them. He's rich. He's from his influential family. He says... Why aren't we protecting ourselves? This is a joke. We should. Th these are infidels. They're terrible people. And why aren't we taking care of our own? Okay. So he has kind of coordinated support for the Mujahideen in Afghanistan, and now he's basically made a you know objection to the U.S. troops and pleaded with the Saudi government not to have them there. And they reject him and say, "Forget it. We're we're not going. We're going to have those troops there to protect us from Saddam." So Al Qaeda is going to steadily train. And now this is totally being bankrolled in Afghanistan, which the Soviet Union, by, you know, when we move through time here a little bit, our Iran-Iraq war is going to end just at the end of the 1980s, about when the Cold War is ending. Uh, Soviet uh, invasion and occupation of Afghanistan is going to end at the end of the 1980s. They are going to pull back. And the Operation Desert Storm is going to be right around, you know, 1990 is when this, this happens right after, really, the... Um, Cold War has come to a halt. So now you're looking at the early 1990s and bin Laden. Afghanistan has been liberated, uh, so to speak, as the Soviets withdrew. So this becomes kind of the foundational area for bin Laden to train. And they establish, tr uh, they establish training regimens. They're um, getting uh, recruiting people, Muslim radicals who would want to join and become terrorists, essentially, to try and uh, basically get U.S. troops out of Saudi Arabia possibly topple the, so the Saudi government and other, uh, you know, kind of monarchs, monarchies that they see here. And um, essentially, that's kind of the goal of Al-Qaeda, is get the U.S. out of the region, get Europe out of the region, but primarily the U.S., and liberate, especially Saudi Arabia. And why is that so important? Why does Saudi Arabia matter so much? Because all of the, the traveling, the birth, the death, the revelations of Muhammad... Uh, Muslims believe it all happened here. The pilgrimages happened here. The Arabian Peninsula is sacred territory. It's the most holy territory. They don't want anyone else on there that's not Muslim. Uh, certainly not in control in any way. So, Al-Qaeda growth. 
you're going to see that they grow, they train, and they're going to start doing smaller attacks. During the Clinton years, the World Trade Center, they could try and bomb in the basement. Uh, it kind of malfunctioned, doesn't, doesn't go off the way they want, kills a couple of people, injures about a thousand in the basement, uh, kind of like the parking area of the World Trade Center, trying to take that down. Um, so it's a kind of a failed attempt, but it's on U.S. soil. It's notable. U.S. Embassy bombings in two African countries. Uh, you know, this is going to, again, they're going to successfully bomb, kill some Americans, kill some diplomats at the U.S. embassies. And so you can see they're kind of ratcheting up. They launch like a, a gunboat attack that blows a hole in the side of the USS Cole, uh, a naval ship. So you see throughout the 1990s going, you know, 93, 98, 2000, they're continuing to peck away. No one, of course, imagined the magnitude of the attack that would hit the United States. That becomes 9-11, kills 3,000 people, utterly shocks America, changes the President W. Bush presidency, and really everything in the United States since. Uh, we just kind of lived in this era of a war on terror. Uh, so 9-11 occurs, uh, obviously September 11th, 2001. So not really too far after the USS Cole, shortly after President Bush has taken office, and it's going to change a ton of things. We get the Department of Homeland Security and uh, the Patriot Act and a, a number of different efforts to address this growing threat of terrorism. Um, and it's going to lead only a month and a half later, in a little more than a month actually, later into a U.S. invasion of Afghanistan. And why do they invade Afghanistan, which is kind of off our map over here? This is because the Taliban, who are in control and have this uh, kind of super fundamentalist government of um, a Muslim law, this kind of theocratic government, I guess you could call it, uh, they are the like happy home base of al-Qaeda and bin Laden. The U.S. says turn them over. They refuse and say they'll continue to support them. So the U.S. invades. They get rid of the Taliban should I say, depose them and start installing a new government, start rebuilding infrastructure, and Bin Laden is kind of forced off into the mountains. They almost get him. Of course, it'll be a long time before they eventually get him in Pakistan where he was comfortably living right under the nose of the Pakistani uh, military leadership. But uh, essentially what's going to happen, that's why the United States in invades. It's a very easy invasion to win. Of course, stay tuned. We still don't have resolution there. The U.S. is scheduling and starting to move forward with withdrawals, and the Taliban is continuing to grow in force and occasionally has these attacks. Can a uh, Afghan government be successful in the long term? That remains to be seen, uh, or if they'll be toppled by the Taliban's uh, forces and power. Also, the invasion of Iraq. When George H.W. Bush decided not to go beyond Kuwait's liberation and attack, there was a lot of dissension in the foreign policy experts in his administration. Some people wanted invasion removal of Saddam and said, he's too great a threat to leave. This guy's trying to get weapons of mass destruction all the time. He's already fought with Iran for a long time. He just took into, he went into Kuwait and took it over. We can't leave this guy in power. Uh, George H.W. Bush, who had been the CIA director, he'd been a representative, he'd been the vice president. A guy had massive foreign policy experience. He's going to say, no, we're not doing that. Well, when his son becomes the president, George W. Bush, a lot of those same people who are kind of the hawks, the war hawks who wanted that removal of Saddam are going to be his administration. It's justified by saying that he has weapons of mass destruction and they actually have these surveillance photographs that look like they've found some. Obviously they never find any. Uh, they do go in and pretty quickly, not as quickly as with Operation Desert Storm, but they are going to pretty quickly in the second Gulf War remove Saddam from power. He goes into hiding and what you get is a many year guerrilla resistance that is kind of headed by Al-Qaeda. Many of them die. Their leaders such as Arqawi are going to die. And um, essentially what's going to happen, you know, Iraq, the United States has withdrawn from it now. It seems to be fairly stable. You still have contentions between the Kurds, the Shia majority, and the Sunni minority who were used to being in charge. But all of that's kind of going on. But that's all the time we have for today. Stay classy, Sam Barlow.